Welcome to Introduction to Visual Culture. What is visual culture, you may be wondering, and why does it matter? Well, the study of visual culture is the study of all things visual in culture, as you may have guessed. So we'll be studying images, cultural production. So these images could be works of art, but they could also be in popular culture in the media. Visual culture is not limited to works of art like painting and sculpture, but it includes everything in our visual culture, everything created by human beings that we can look at visually. And for the purposes of this course, that will include works of art, but also media, advertising, television, the internet, movies, video games, photography, posters, etc. In other words, visual culture is the study of all things visual in society. And as you may have noticed, we live in an increasingly visually mediated world. So as a personal example, I finally got a smartphone about six months ago. And I also, in January, gave birth to our first child. And so the combination of these things meant that I was spending a lot of time feeding our little girl and scrolling through Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram on my smartphone. And sometimes clicking on articles meant to entice. You may or may not have seen this image of the giant squid. The article claimed that this was a mutant fish caused by the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. But a little more research shows that this is actually a composite image made up of this image and this image. How readily do we believe what we see? Are we able to analyze the visual world in which we live? Or are we simply like fish, unaware of the water all around us? A fish swims in the ocean but isn't aware of that water. It just takes it for granted. Similarly, do we take images for granted? Are we in a sea of images completely unaware of the images around us? This course will give us the tools to understand how to analyze the images around us. The first part of the textbook provides six different strategies for analyzing visual texts, and each strategy is given its own chapter. So chapter one of your textbook on iconology deals with decoding the content and symbolism in an image. It shows how we can decipher the symbolism in images. That's particularly relevant for art history. Chapter 2 on form shows how early 20th century art theorists began to argue that the formal qualities of art were the most important. Those formal qualities include things like color, lines, shape. And these theories were coming along at the same time as abstract art. Abstract art dealt with the colors, the forms, the lines, and the shapes within a painting as opposed to the symbolic content. So that's why uh, form became important. Chapter 3 is the only chapter on art history, and it's more of a critique of the discipline of art history. Chapter 4 deals with ideology. It looks at the argument that some theorists make that all images have hidden agendas and ideologies behind them and underlying them. Chapter 5, Semiotics, shows that the symbols and images in our culture carry meaning, but the meaning that we attribute to those symbols is not inherent to those symbols and images. They're actually, the meaning we give to symbols and images is a cultural construct, something um, we share within a culture and learn. Finally, chapter six on hermeneutics is where we think about interpretation and what it means to interpret images. After these six chapters, sex, section two of your text will look at how to apply these tools for analyzing images. It'll apply these tools to fine art, photography, film, television, and new media. The visual world in which we live creates meaning and values. Images, obviously, 
convey meaning, convey values, but they can also shape the meaning and values of our culture, just as they reflect those meaning, those, those values. So what do images mean and what do they tell us about ourselves? Certainly this is an important question for politicians, but this wasn't always the case. So in 1860, when Abraham Lincoln ran for president, newspapers were not yet even able to print photographs. However, 100 years later, in 1960, the election debate between Kennedy and Nixon, shown here, was televised, and it had an important, profound impact on the results of the election, a real-world impact. Kennedy was willing to wear makeup for the debate. Nixon, on the other hand, was feeling sick that day. Kennedy was younger, a little bit more handsome, and so he looked better on television overall. People who heard the debate on the radio thought that Nixon had won, while those who saw the debate on television thought Kennedy had won. Presidential elections continued to be contested through images, and we will look at an example from the beginning of the current election, or election that will be coming up. The visual font Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio used is intended to show a sense of casualness. On the other hand, he included um, an image of the United States and then received criticism from Hawaii and Alaska because they did not end up in that image as if he was excluding them. Back in previous 2008 election of President Obama, this image became a rallying point for his supporters, created by Shepard Ferry. But then opponents compared the color scheme of the image of Obama to um, an image of Lenin. And maybe they weren't that far off. Maybe there wasn't a, a sort of similar aesthetic between these two images. Continuation of that theme, Obama is portrayed as a communist leader in the long line of communist leaders. So Obama is not the only one for whom images have mattered. President Bush also created an image. He created an image of himself as an Air Force pilot to, to convey a certain message about who he is. And then a company took the opportunity to make an action figure out of that image. Perhaps the publicity stunt backfired, or maybe it didn't. Maybe this was just another mode of the dissemination of certain kind of a certain kind of image about the president. Another publicity stunt can be seen uh, in an image that is included in your text in the introduction. Reality is orchestrated through this image in which Bush, at a media conference in May of 2003, announces mission accomplished, as you can see on the banner there. Although the war obviously was not actually over, the image is intended to convey that message. Of course, today images have also had more serious consequences. So back in 2005, in Denmark, a newspaper printed this image of Mohammed, but it was unprepared for the global backlash against this image that ensued. It included demonstrations in the Indian-controlled part of Kashmir, death threats against the artist. Eleven Muslim nations condemned the cartoon, and there was a rebuke from the United Nations. In addition, Denmark's 200,000 Muslims felt that the cartoon reflected the, an intensifying anti-immigrant climate that stigmatized minor minorities and was actually radicalizing young Muslims. And a counter image was this image. This is the Danish flag in the shape of a coffin burning. It's an event that is meant to be seen visually and to have a sharp visual impact on those who see it. And then, beyond the actual visual event performance, the image is meant to be disseminated across um, 
the world through contemporary media. In this, in this instance, the cartoonist Kurt Westergaard ended up going into hiding, but you're probably all thinking of a more recent example that ended much more tragically. The, the satirical paper, Charlie Edbo, published offensive images, not only of Muhammad, but also of other religious leader, leaders, as you can see here. You must, he, um, Charlie Hedbo must be veiled, is what they're shouting here. And then this image, particularly offensive, of um, Islamic terrorists beheading the Prophet Muhammad. And he says, I'm the Prophet, stupid. And then it says, kill the infidel. And this image ended in the murder of 12 of the cartoonists. So images can matter. Images really can matter, despite what you may think. But how much time do you spend looking at images? How much time do you spend thinking about and identifying what you see when you look at an image? Most of us do not look that closely. Most of us are fairly passive. How do we read images? Well, your book starts with a set of seven things to identify when looking at an image. First is, what kind of painting is it? So this is particularly relevant for painting. Um, is it a landscape, a portrait, a still life, a nude? Subject matter, what is shown? So can you look at the image and identify what you see? Where is it? What's the location? What's the historical period? What's the time of year or the season that is depicted? What time of day is it? And then what's the particular event, instant, or moment depicted in the image? This particular painting can be analyzed using those seven identifying features. So first of all, what kind of painting is it? This is the Hay Wayne, and we can identify it as a landscape. There are people, but they're very insignificant to the overall picture. They're just part of the landscape. It's not a portrait because they're just part of the overall landscape. So what about the subject matter? Second question, subject matter. What is shown? What do we see in the picture? We see trees. We see a little cottage. We can identify that it's a river. Um, there's clouds. There's this cart. We can keep looking for details, keep going. There's a dog, a horse drawing the cart, a woman in the water. You may not be able to see all of this in this image. But the setting, third question, what's the setting and location? It's probably in Europe based on our um, ability to identify. Could be in the United States or somewhere else with a similar climate. What about the historical period? Number four. Since it's a horse-drawn cart, we would probably guess that it was an image from at least 100 years ago. Finally, time of day in particular, or, and season. Warm day, summer day, middle of the day. And then the event or moment. Uh, well, it's a scene depicting this cart being drawn through the water. So these are things that we can discover just by looking at this image. Your book calls it a what you see is what you get kind of image, kind of painting. But what about images that have content that this method might miss? For example, what if an image has symbolism? So taking an image of the Holy Family, for example, it's a great example um, of an image that we cannot interpret simply by asking these seven questions because we would need to know that the staff would represent that this is a picture of Joseph and that the blue on Mary's outfit is generally reserved for Mary and even that the foliage and the flowers here are related to devotional practices um, for Mary. This is symbolic. These are symbols that we would need to know cultural context in order to identify. So on pages, pages 24 and 25 of your book, they, these pages describe Erwin Panofsky's three levels of meaning, which help us analyze images with 
symbolic content. So he gives us these three levels of meaning. Panofsky was an art historian from the first half of the 20th century, and he identifies first the primary level, or natural subject matter. What does that mean? Well, he calls that the expressionistic level. So say you were from another culture, say you were from ancient Greece, and that's before Christ, you had never heard of the Holy Family, what could you identify? You could identify that there is a family, possibly, if you have an, a knowledge of family as a human being. You can identify there's a baby and a woman and a man. You can ident identify that there's a landscape with mountains, trees, and flowers in the front. And you could even identify expressionistically the maybe the emotions and the relationship between the people in this image. But then when you get to the secondary level, or conventional subject matter, you start to understand the, um, the, the gestures. This is where you would start to understand what does the blue mean um, in, her, in her outfit. The example given in your book has to do with tipping of a hat. So in that example, a man tips his hat, and in the first level you might notice that it's a warm, friendly gesture. But in the second level of meaning, that's when you could identify that tipping your hat means saying hello. Finally, in the third level, we analyze the culture from which the person is from. So when a person tips his hat, we could then identify that he's conveying the fact that he's from um, possibly 19th century England, a certain culture where that practice is done. It's not done um, in the United States in the 21st century. He doesn't realize he's com communicating the attitude of his culture, um, but he is. That's intrinsic meaning or content, the third level. And a quote by Erwin Panofsky says that it is apprehended by ascertaining those underlying principles which revealed the basic attitude of a nation, a period, a class, a religious or philosophical persuasion, and then qualified by one person and condensed into one work. So what he's saying is that when you're trying to understand the intrinsic meaning, you have to understand the underlying principles um, and the basic attitudes of a certain group of people, whether it's a nation or people from a certain class or time period or religion. So using Panofsky's iconolo <laughs> um, iconological analysis, which is a little bit different than iconographical analysis, iconology has to do with knowledge of images rather than just writing of images. So we'll use his method in a way to understand this image. So in the very first level, we can understand the we can understand the gesture between two people. And we can understand possibly that they're wealthy, but that might be all we can get. We need to start to know the symbolism behind this image to really get what it's trying to say. So for some background information, this may have been a marriage certificate there was a witness to the event. This shows that there's a witness to the event. So the husband is holding his hand in oath, that being the promise of the covenant of marriage. On the back, since it's an event witnessed, the artist writes, Jan van Eyck was here. So the artist is Jan van Eyck from, uh, lived in 1390, from 1390 to 1441. He was born in Belgium, modern day Belgium. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty old image. The artist, like I said, wrote Jan van Eyck was here on the back. We can tell that the, um, the couple is prosperous, that there are ordinary household items that are also very sumptuous, but there's also symbolic meaning behind many of these images, or many of these items in the painting. Starting with the chandelier. One candle is lit. What could that mean? Possibly it's a representation of Christ, the one God, as, the pres as present with this couple at um, the day of their marriage. But also it could have to do with the unity candle, something we still see today, where two candles light another candle, and it's representative of the un unity within two people being married. What about the fact that their shoes are removed? Why would that be the case in this image? 
Well, if you know anything about biblical narratives, Moses, when he encounters God in the burning bush, takes off his shoes. He does so because he's on holy ground. In that sense, this image is trying to say that the sacrament of marriage is holy. The dog represents fidelity. Even today we have the name Fido for dogs. Fido comes from the word fidelity, which means faithfulness. Um, Anybody who's had a dog or a cat can tell the difference in terms of their fidelity. The woman looks pregnant, which represents possibly her ability to bear children, although it could also just be a fashion statement uh, based on the fashions of the day. This idea of fertility is also conveyed through the bed and possibly also through the oranges on the windowsill. They are fruit, could represent the innocence of Adam and Eve before the fall, but they could also represent fruitfulness in marriage and the possibility of children. Another image from a similar time period, uh, 1428 from the Master of Flamand, also seems to be a, uh, a simple picture of domestic scenes until you look a little bit more closely. We would not know, based on our basic what you see is what you get kind of analysis, um, that this is the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. But these, the flower here represents Mary. The symbol, the lily, symbolizes purity. In addition, there's a Cupid flying through the air. It's very hard to see, but if you can look up an, another image of this, of this painting, you might be able to find a detail of this Cupid flying through the window with a cross, holding a cross. Um, this could be a little baby Jesus. Um, coming to impregnate Mary right through the air, right at the moment that Gabriel is talking. The mouse trap on the windowsill. So this is um, a carpenter's bench, and there's a mouse trap on the windowsill. That's a symbolic uh, object. The cross is referred to as a trap of the devil. So Christ is being incarnated at this moment. It's the moment when the trap for the devil is coming into the world. So this is a story that is taking place in the 15th century in sort of a domestic scene from, 14, from the 1400s, but it's also referencing the first century and kind of happening at the same time in the first century as well as in the 15th century. The religious and the domestic are entirely intersected and intertwined in this image. On the left-hand side, we see the patrons of this of this painting. People who paid for the painting were often painted into the image to show that they too were present when um, Christ was born, when, when Christ came into the world. There's also an interesting little um, detail, which is that the pages of the book are fluttering. And, and who knows exactly why? Perhaps it's because of the, this moment when Adriel, uh, sorry, the angel Gabriel descends into this room, possibly it's a reference to that, the wind that's probably going through the air as, Andrew, as the angel lands. But it could be other things as well. And since this is a carpenter's bench, we know that's Joseph. So the symbolism is rich. This might be a prayer shawl, a Jewish prayer shawl. It could go on and on. So we've looked at the symbolism of these images, the disguised symbolism in these basic domestic scenes, but we could also think about what do these, what could we say about the cultures in which these um, images are created? We, what could we say about the basic attitudes and ideas of the cultures in which these uh, these paintings were painted? We could talk about the value of marriage, the value of childbearing, the value of faithfulness, the value of, this, of marriage as a sacrament in an image like this one. Um, we could talk about what it means to be a patron in an image like this, what it meant to, why it was important to intersect domestic everyday life with 
religion. What do these images tell us about the cultures in which they're created? So going back to the Marco Rubio image, the font that he used tells us something about the society in which we live. If he creates, if he uses a very casual font, it tells us that we are looking for leaders who are relatable, who are not aloof from everyday people. So as you continue to look around you, think about what the images you see tell us about the society in which you live, and also think about what the images you see show. I hope that this has been a helpful beginning to your analysis of images.